Hello, my name is Shane Latane, and welcome to Digital Design Media 1, Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop. I'll be your instructor. This little bit of information is how you can best get a hold of me. Shane L at Shaw.ca is my email. I'm an illustrator, graphic designer, and animator. I've also been an instructor for over 12 years now. You can see my own personal portfolio site at raininspain.net. But most importantly, I do have a teaching blog. IdeaRefinery.net is where I post project briefs, student work, and even tutorial videos. Let's discuss what we're going to be covering in this course. This course introduces digital design applications for image making in both vector and raster formats. Content-driven projects combined with workshops will focus on creating images for different types of media and using the right tool for the right tasks. This introduction to digital imaging provides a basic foundation of skills with Adobe Creative Suite and Photoshop and Illustrator in particular. Let's talk about what we're actually going to be discussing in this course. From weeks 1 to 6, we will be exploring Adobe Illustrator. Adobe Illustrator is vector-based, meaning it uses underlying math and geometry to create what are called vector shapes. Those vector shapes are then colored and effects can be added. But what makes vector shapes really useful is the fact that they're scalable, meaning that we can use a graphic at any size and it will always appear crisp. That is the primary distinction between Illustrator and Photoshop. Illustrator, being vector-based, allows us to create imagery that can be used in a broader range of situations. Another thing we can do with Adobe Illustrator is use its type tools. Adobe Illustrator has some very strong type tools and we will explore typography using Adobe Illustrator. Illustrator also has some wonderful effects and gradients tools that allow us to take our imagery into some interesting areas. One thing I really enjoy about Illustrator is that it can handle things like this poster very well, but it can also do things like this. This is an illustration that I've done that I will be showing you guys in this class. From weeks 7 to 13, we'll be looking at Adobe Photoshop. Now, we all know Adobe Photoshop for its powerful photo editing tools. This, for example, will be one of the exercises that we will do. But what I really like using Photoshop for is its ability to create composite imagery, as we see here. We will be doing a photo compositing exercise as well during this course. Another thing that Photoshop does very well is it allows us to do digital painting. We won't be doing that in this course, although if you are interested in digital painting, you can take my GD216 Illustration 1 class. But there's one more thing that Photoshop can do. Photoshop rather powerful animation tools. We'll take a look at those tools as we proceed in the course. Now this course is divided into projects and exercises. There are three projects with specific goals. Let me just outline what those are going to be first. Project number one is a logo design. A logo design for a local nonprofit society that looks to help people grow their own produce. We will be using Illustrator for this project. Project number two is also going to be for the City Farm Society. In this project, we are going to be creating a set of four icons that represent four distinct categories in the City Farms organization. And again, we will primarily be using Illustrator to create these icons. Project number three, we will be continuing on with the City Farms client. We will be creating a poster that advertised their weekly farmer's market. The reason I do these three projects as a linked set is that I think it mimics very closely what you might expect to do as a graphic designer. It's also helpful to have a branded campaign in your portfolio that encompasses a number of different media. But along with the projects, we will also be doing exercises, usually one a week. Let's take a look at what those are going to be. Exercise 1 is going to be an introduction to Adobe Illustrator. In this exercise, we are going to be using Adobe Illustrator's pen tool to recreate the vector paths of a familiar logo. In Exercise 2, we will be creating a layered composition. Here we will be primarily looking at how to use Illustrator's Layers panel to keep our illustrations organized. But we will also be introduced to some very key concepts such as the Effects panel and the Appearance panel. In Exercise 3, 
we will be exploring Illustrator's color tools and how to work with digital color generally as we create this color composition. In exercise 4, we'll be using Illustrator's brush tools and stroke panel to create a painterly portrait. In exercise 5, we will explore blend modes and opacity masks as we create this weathered sign. In exercise 6, we are going to begin working with Photoshop. In this exercise, we are going to be exploring Photoshop's masking tools as well as layer effects as we create this composite image. In exercise 7, we will explore Photoshop's photo editing tools as we create this enhanced portrait. In exercise 8, we will be looking at creating a photo composite where we take images from disparate areas and create a new composite illustration. In exercise 9, we will create an animated GIF. In exercise 10, we will jump back to Illustrator and create a brochure as we explore Illustrator's type and text tools. First, let's talk generally about graphic design. If we were to reduce graphic design to its component parts, it might look something like this. The first thing that we would think of primarily when we're talking about graphic design is imagery. That is, in fact, what this class will be primarily focusing on. But it is only one part of graphic design. Typography is also a large part of what graphic design is all about. This class will also be looking at typography to some degree, although there are other classes in the GDD program that focus exclusively on typography. I do recommend them highly. Another key component to graphic design, though, is layout, which to some degree is just combining imagery and typography in a context. That context can be dramatically different in today's digital environment. We can be creating for media as diverse as a printed business card to a website. But no matter what media we are designing for, we will always be thinking about how our imagery and our typography are combined in a pleasing and coherent manner. We will be touching on all three of these components at various points in this class. But let's first start talking about imagery. I like to think of imagery sometimes as existing on a spectrum. On one side we see the simple pictogram, an image reduced to two dimensions with details removed. On the other side of this spectrum we see photography. We can sometimes think of imagery as having less and more information. A digital file of both these images would show you just how much information one has. The pictogram on the left would be a very small file size while the photograph on the right would be a very large file size. And both these images have their uses. The pictogram on the left would be an image you might find on a sign in a dog park reminding owners to pick up after their dogs. Whereas the photograph on the right would look good on a package of dog food to suggest your dog could look as good as this. The image on the left could be any dog. The image on the right is this particular dog. But imagery gives us more than just a quantity of information. An image like this, an illustration, gives us more. That image introduces a qualitative difference. It suggests an interpretation, a human perspective, a human hand. That individual stylization and idiosyncratic vision suggests an individual. And this is when imagery can really start to become interesting. It's important to remember that graphic design is a creative pursuit, and this is your opportunity to flex some creative muscles. Let's talk a little bit more about imagery. Let's say, for example, that you want to convey the idea of a dog. That is what we call the content of your message. If you then show me a picture of a dog, then what you've done is unified your content and your form. When you do that, that type of image is called an icon, the thing itself, when the content and the form of that message are the same thing. While this is very clear, it's also not very sophisticated. This is something that I might expect to see in a toddler's reading primer. But if you're going to be communicating with a sophisticated audience, then you may want to reconsider how you represent things. For example, we could also express the idea of a dog this way. 
by showing something associated with the dog, in this case, a dog bone. Whether I show it as a graphic pictogram or a photograph, it is still considered what's called an index. We don't need to remember that. We just need to know that now our imagery is starting to get a little bit more interesting. Now, we all know that dogs like dog bones, but this imagery requires a little bit more experience with dogs. But those who know would understand very quickly what this refers to. Again, this is an associated object that still represents a dog, but in a very tangential way. But there's another category of imagery that I want to discuss here. We could add something to this image and turn it into a visual metaphor, also known as an active index. But again, all we really need to know is that a visual metaphor combines two separate ideas into one visual form. The visual metaphor is where imagery really starts to get interesting. I think it's important that all graphic designers be able to work effectively using visual metaphor. It allows for all sorts of interesting commentary. Let's revisit these three logos quickly. You'll notice that each one of them in some way incorporates a visual metaphor. The one on the left suggests a Wi-Fi symbol using appropriately shaped fruits and vegetables. The one in the middle adjusted in a letter form to suggest a house. And the one on the right has combined a wayfinding symbol and a beat. Now our logo designs don't have to incorporate visual metaphors, but they're more interesting when they do. Let's take a look at a couple of other examples. This is a lovely and elegant graphical suggestion. Just a couple of cuts and we get the idea of freedom. Here we see a simple substitution of the fence posts for pencils, but we now have a perfect metaphor for an art farm, whatever that might be. I love the negative shapes that are being created in this logo. A fabulous use of what we call negative space. In this final logo, we see the diamond and the book become one fused metaphor. As we proceed to our first project, I want you to keep the idea of a visual metaphor in mind. 